First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for tuning in uh, through your computers and for being here for this, the um, annual Stanley Frost Lecture, which is the 196th meeting of the James McGill Society. And the presentation this evening is going to be done by someone we all know, Professor Peter McNally. And um, it's no surprise that he'll be talking about the history of McGill. And of course, what goes into writing the history of McGill, which is, uh, which is quite a feat. I'd like to um, kick things off by saying McGill University is situated on the traditional territory of the Ghanaian Ganahaka, <clears throat> a place which has is, which is long served as a, a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. We recognized and respect the Ganaganaka as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today. I'd also like to point out that today is the 32nd anniversary of a night of unbelievable sa savagery which took place at the Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal in which 14 women were killed simply because they were women. You need to speak up more. It's very hard to hear you. Okay. I, I'll raise the mic. Can you hear me now? Is that better? There's a lot of volume. Like this is almost distorted. Okay. I'd like us to take a, a minute or so to reflect upon what happened that evening. And I'll just go through a, a list of, of names. And every one of them was a person who left a family bereaved. Genevieve Bergeron, Hélène Colgan, Natalie Croteau, Barbara Deniau, Anne-Marie Edward, Maud Havirnik, Barbara Kluznik, Widojevich, Maurice Lanier, Laganier, Maurice Leclerc, Anne-Marie Lemay, Sonia Peltier, Michel Richard, Annie Saint-Arnaud, and Anne Turcotte. Please take a moment of reflection. Thank you. Well, thank you for showing up for this meeting today in person, especially because of the um, inclement weather we've had. It's a mess out there and there's slush all over the city. It's a perfect winter day. Um, I want to thank also the, the people who bring you the, the virtual presentation. Uh, John Childs at the back, who is responsible for the video. Uh, Jonathan Roy, who's sitting to my right, who um, handles the, uh, the noise and the, the sound. And of course, uh, our own Adria, who is handling the chat rooms and everything. Thank you, Adria. And the guru uh, behind all of this is uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Stuart McCombie and uh, our many thanks to him. I'd like to um, just say that uh, the James McGill Society, of course, is a nonprofit organization which depends on your membership fees and any other generosity you might put our way to keep going. And uh, I want to thank you for, for being generous. I want to thank you for maintaining your memberships and encourage you to encourage others to, to join. Um, uh, the masthead of Mad Magazine had it figured out. Uh, they had the slogan, it's $25 cheap. <laughs> um, I'd like to turn, to turn now to um, 
uh, Susan Button, our membership chair, to see if she has any news on membership, and then perhaps to Peter for a second for finances. And then I'll call upon Susan just to pick up the mic to introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you. Well, no, I'd just like to join with Ron in saying thank you, everyone who has supported the James McGill Society over these past, especially these past two years, because it's been difficult, as you can well know, and very challenging with meetings and the pandemic. I think we're enjoying, actually, these hybrid meetings. So thank you very much for your support. You know, it's very important to me. I've, the James McGill Society is very close to my heart, and I personally thank each and every one of you for your ongoing support. And I'd also just like to say a welcome, a special welcome to some invited groups. Mura has been invited tonight. That's the McGill University Reti Retirees Association. Welcome. And also the University Women's Club of Montreal have been invited. If anyone is interested after this meeting uh, in becoming a member, you have my email address and I'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter has nothing to say about finances, so if you don't mind, could you um, please introduce well, our speaker? Well, yeah, speaking of a man who no, needs no introduction, but I'm, it's an honor and a privilege because this James McGill Society meeting is the annual Stanley Frost Lecture, and it's an honor and a privilege for me because working for Dr. Frost was one of the best jobs I ever had in my life, working on the two-volume history of McGill. And I can think of no one better than Peter McNally to carry on this task of writing volume three of the history. He has approached this task with honesty and diligence and an unwavering commitment to getting the job done. Now, Peter is very well prepared to undertake this work, having a BA honors history from the University of Western Ontario and an MA in history from McGill, in addition to his BLS and MLS from McGill. Now an emeritus professor in the School of Information Studies, he is also serving as director of the History McGill Project and executive secretary of the James McGill Society. His great interests are the history of books, printing and libraries, and he has many significant publications in these areas also extensively involved in the activities of the mcgill academic community peter was a founding member of the association of mcgill university librarians and has served as the president of the james mcgill society and the president of the mcgill faculty club peter is the recipient of many honors and awards too many to mention but is proud of being awarded both the queen elizabeth ii golden jubilee medal and the diamond jubilee medal now, please join me in welcoming Peter as we look forward to hearing about his current work on the history of McGill. Professor Peter McNally. Thank you very much, Susan, for that generous introduction. Thank you, uh, members of the James McGill Society, ladies and gentlemen, for this opportunity of speaking before you this evening. Now, you've all seen that I own a, a tie and a jacket, so I hope you won't take exception for the fact that I'm going to take off the jacket and loosen the tie. I find that whenever I lecture, I build up quite a bit of body heat, so this is gonna be my opportunity to prepare a little bit in advance. There, that feels a lot more comfortable. Um, two years ago, the Society's president uh, of that time, Chris Lyons, put together a bicentennial uh, uh, program for the James McGill Society in celebration of McGill's 200th anniversary that was supposed to culminate in tonight's presentation. Uh, you can see there was anticipation on the part of many people, myself included, that the published volumes might have been available this evening. But, of course, as we all know, COVID intervened, things happened. In my own case, 
a lack of uh, research files in my office. I uh, didn't have access for about eight months to my office, plus also the fact that uh, other McGill facilities, frankly, weren't working to full, um, uh, uh, to, to full uh, capacity. And uh, so as a result, I would have to say that volume three although is 97% completed, but not quite. What still has to be done? Well, there's still editing, there's still footnoting, fact checking, there's even a bit of filling in and gaps, but we are getting there. Um, I'm, I think for me to be here this evening is highly significant, though, just the same. The James McGill Society and the History of McGill Project enjoy a symbiotic relationship. In, in 1975, Dr. Stanley Frost, who had been Vice Principal of Administration and Professional Faculties, accepted the invitation from Principal Bell to write McGill's official history, financed, I might add, by a generous request from the estate of Principal F. Cyril James. To assist in this task, Dr. Frost, along with Dr. Edward Bensley and Dr. R.V.V. V. Nichols, founded the James McGill Society, also in 1975. Some of you will recall Dr. Frost's numerous presentations before the Society on aspects of his monumental two-volume study, uh, all typed by Susan Button. And uh, up, upon completion of the, of the comp of, of this two volumes, of these two volumes, he, Dr. Frost assumed that the James McGill Society would cease to exist. To his amazement, the society continued attracting speakers and audiences. In my turn, I have appreciated being able to use the society as a forum for presenting aspects of volume three, and I've profited greatly from feedback and suggestions. In addition, I've published several articles on McGill during this era, 1970 to 2002, which is basically the last 30 years of the 20th century, the end of the 20th century. And before talking about uh, volume three in any depth, let's just remind ourselves a little bit about the context of what happened in those last 30 years of the, of, of, of the previous century. Politically and economically, uh, it, was a it was a turbulent time for Quebec, Canada, and the world. But also, it was um, a, an era when significant uh, changes, a significant reinvention of McGill's academic programs occurred. And that should not be underestimated. In other words, there was a great deal of turbulence surrounding us, but a lot still happened here at McGill. Internationally, the last third of the 20th century was highlighted by nuclear stalemate, continuation of the Cold War between the Western world and the Soviet Union, the United States engaged in anti-communist wars in Vietnam and power politics around the world, and then suddenly, between 1989 and 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed along with communist regimes across Central and Eastern Europe. The Middle East continued as a center of world instability, fueled in part by the world's dependence upon petroleum, oil. And of course, oil played a crucial role in another uh, 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 characteristic of the late 20th century, stagflation. High inflation, low growth eventually brought under control in conjunction with neoliberal deregulation and unfettered uh, market capitalism. Many observers spoke of the end of history with the United States as the only superpower holding sway over the world as a bastion of economic and political freedom. However, as we all know, in 2000 and 2001, the political and economic bubble burst on both those claims. Uh, on the one hand, of course, on September the 11th, 20, uh, 2001, there was the terrorist attack on the United States leading to catastrophic American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And also, of course, there was in 2000, 2001, the dot-com bubble. Bursting. And therefore, both the economic and the political status quo, which people thought would go on forever, was shown to be as soft as it turned out to be. In Canada, the late 20th century was characterized by stagflation, but also by constitutional change exemplified by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the 1982 patriation of the Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and then, of course, Brian Mulroney's ill-fated Meech Lake Accord. 
In Quebec, the late 20th century was typified by separatism and language legislation, promotion of French, diminution of the English language. The Liberal Party and the Party Quebecois fought one another to a standstill. With both parties, both parties in the 21st century consigned to the political wilderness. Um, the world, uh, many of us can look back upon that late 20th century world uh, with great familiarity, but we know a lot has changed. The names uh, Robert Barassa, René Lévesque, Jacques Parizeau, Lucien Bouchard dominate the, the political landscape. As individuals, those of us who were here at McGill during those years realized we were living in the midst of momentous times in which we had front row center seats. We were very much in the fulcrum, uh, partly because of what was happening at McGill, but being in downtown Montreal on the McGill campus, you felt very much that you were part of these much larger Quebec Canadian issues that we were that were swirling around us. The university put much effort into steering a safe course, taking advantage of opportunities and avoiding missteps. McGill's main concern during the late 20th century were three. Um, academic strength, distinction, and ac excellence. That was the official goal. Finding the necessary financial resources to fulfill its academic uh, mission. And internal harmony as the third. Avoiding inter nissan warfare that would destabilize the university or invite outside issues or, or, or interference. So what are the issues involved with writing something such as uh, the history of McGill? Well, there are a number of questions and issues which pop up immediately. Is one writing a research-based history or a gift shop history? What are the issues facing the historical study of McGill? Well, there are a number. First of all, McGill does have a disputed history. Is McGill a valiant example of a minority language group creating its own institutions? Or is it a monument to a rapacious capitalist colonial past? And of course, there are um, arguments one can find on both sides of that issue. Um, the, the perception in some quarters that McGill is, uh, is, has, is unseemly wealthy mm -hmm. and neither needing or, uh, nor deserving taxpayer funding. Internally, McGill has done things and made decisions that are and were controversial. Does one discuss them or ignore them? The warts. What do you do about the warts in any institution's history? Does one show them or does one ignore them? My view is that one must show uh, the warts, or at, least, or at least some of them, but you need not dwell upon them, nor need you sensationalize them. This is intended to be McGill's official history, not the National Enquirer's history of McGill. Um, it's often a way in which these things are done. The other uh, uh, issue is of concern, uh, the things that concern one in writing any sort of an institutional history is the point of view. What is the point of view that one is going to take? Uh, we all have a point of view. We all come from a background, social, cultural, philosophical. I am no different from anybody else. I bring a, a whole uh, train load of, um, of, of prior uh, ideas and attitudes. However, that is uh, not the same as, um, as being in, in a situation of, of advocacy, polemics, or apologetics. Um, as I never held a senior administrative position at McGill, I f felt no need to defend any position or decision, nor did I feel the need to attack or um, uh, any position either, simply for the sake of doing so. My research method was archival, not interviewing, although I did some consultations. Archi archival research, for those of you who have done it, what you know, can be exciting and frustrating with much time spent with little to show for it, alternating with remarkable finds in unlikely places. 
At the start of my work on Volume 3, I had a small budget for research assistance. All of the people who worked for me were very good, but I must tell you that the first one I had was outstanding. Uh, unfortunately, he cannot be here this evening, but this would be Christopher Lyons, who is now the head of Rare Books and Special Collections at McLennan Library. And I must say that the work he did for me when I began in initially uh, has uh, stood me in, uh, in, in a good place right from the very beginning. The McGill University Archives is the oldest university archives in Canada, established by Principal James in 1962. Its holdings are vast, and I received excellent support from its staff. As with most archives, however, its staff is limited, and the organization of the collections is incomplete. I found myself combing through masses of box and files with sometimes mixed results. Uh, in my initial draft for this, I said it was tons of material, and maybe I should have stuck with tons of material. I couldn't believe sometimes how many boxes there were. Um, I found um, a large part of what I used, however, in the end, I must tell you, were actually public records. Reports of the university and government, financial reports of the Board of Governors, faculty annual reports. Numerous people have kindly read drafts of the work and they've provided helpful feedback. This is the, uh, what I just uh, am saying now is in the way of a general introduction. And what I would like to do now is to just review in a general sort of way, if I may, what it is that uh, uh, I was, uh, what, what I came up with, Jonathan. Thank you. There we are. Now, it's just a question for the little mouse to do what it's supposed to do. There we are. Ah, well, here we are. Well, let's go back one step further, shall we? Um, this is my uh, talk, and uh, you, can, you can see that uh, on the screen, um, this is the, um, um, uh, the, the, the fly jacket for uh, Dr. Frost's second volume, and there we have the Arts Building, now called the McBain, uh, call McBain's Arts Building, uh, in a winter scene, uh, and not, a, not a freezing rain scene, I might add, but uh, I think that this gives us all a very good idea of, of, of the tenor. Uh, the McGill Crest, well, I think, I, I think that speaks for itself. This is Cyril James. You may ask yourself, why have I Cyril James um, on, the, uh, 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 on, on the screen? Um, Cyril James was principal from 1940 to 1962. Uh, but when I arrived at McGill in the 1960s and even into the 1970s, Cyril James's personality and character remained extremely strong. He cast a long shadow over the university, and one of the reasons was is that he had a highly personalized, centralized administrative style. He basically ran the university with the assistance of two vice principals, uh, uh, an office of secretaries, and a, and a handful of officials. He ran it as a one-man show, basically. And uh, when I came to McGill in the 1960s and through into the 70s, uh, there was always talk that we have to have something different from the James style. And uh, this, and uh, to get away from a centralized one-man show. Um, I should add that, of course, James is also very important because of his prolonged uh, disputes with, uh, with uh, Premier Duplessis over uh, federal money coming to McGill and other Quebec universities. And uh, it uh, it's, it's, uh, doesn't hurt us just to remind ourselves of him. In 1962, um, James was um, succeeded by Principal uh, H. Rock Robertson. Uh, and I might add, I have close personal and very fond memories of Rock Robertson. He, he was an excellent principal. Um, and um, he, uh, he began in 1962, and this coincided, of course, with federal money coming to Quebec and, other and, and, and to universities in other provinces, but passing through provincial capitals for the provinces to distribute as they saw fit. And this is an important element. 
Um, under Rock Robertson, there was massive physical transformation of the McGill campus, uh, Rock, uh, new buildings everywhere, new faculties, management and education, the McGill University Press, and significantly, in 1967, the James Administration Building. And it's in 1967 that McGill can be said to have begun a, um, its civil service, its bureaucracy. Um, and that is, is, from my perspective, an important thing to remember. Bureaucracy coming to McGill is relatively late compared with many universities. Uh, the other important thing that happened under his time, which has a great impact into the future, was the Perron Royal Commission on Education and its recommendations on higher education specifically and universities. And this plays a major role um, going in, into the future. So in terms of buildings, finances, academic programs, uh, relationships with Quebec City, so many other things. Rock Robertson's uh, 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 years, eight years, from 62 to 70, uh, in fact, play a crucial um, starting point for understanding what happens in the Bell um, and um, Bell Johnson Shapiro years. Now, where my study begins in earnest is with Robert Bell. Robert Bell uh, became principal in 1970. Uh, for, he is the third principal to have been a McGill st faculty member. James uh, Robertson uh, preceded him. They were also faculty members. And I should add that they are the only three principals we have ever had in the, his in the university's history, 200-year history, who were faculty members. He is also the second McGill principal to have been a McGill graduate. And this is very important. He was a nuclear physicist with an international reputation. And under his watch, um, a, a lot of things happened. It began, first of all, with the financial crisis when, uh, the, uh, when, when the grant from Quebec City for the year was going to be something, was predicted to be something like 20% less than anticipated, which would have created major problems. Uh, also, he played the major role in McGill operating between 1969 and 1974 a SAGEP program, while at the same time reducing the bachelor programs from four years to three years. It was a massive undertaking. Um, he, um, uh, the, uh, um, but during his period, there were also some serious problems which did happen. Um, I should rephrase that. There were some crises issues. The first one was McDonald College. And uh, there was a, and I'll talk about that a bit later on, uh, there was a serious attempt from Quebec City to close down McDonald College and the Faculty of Agriculture. So that was external. And internally, there was in the economics department uh, a, a, a massive um, scandal uh, revolving around three uh, professors, Deutsch, Weldon, and Asmacopoulos. The Deutsch, Weldon, and Asmacopoulos affair. And uh, this is, again, one of those issues. Does one talk about it or what does one not talk about it? Um, at least one of the people involved in it is still alive. Uh, many uh, other people are still with us. Um, it's one of those issues which I think had to be discussed, but perhaps uh, with, shall we say, care and, uh, and discretion. Um, let's look at a few more pictures here. This is um, uh, Bob Bell's wife, Jean Bell. Jean Bell was a graduate of McGill. Uh, she won the gold medal in uh, Shakespeare gold medal from the English department. And she also received an honorary doctorate from McGill, a D-Lit. She is the only wife of a McGill principal, uh, or I should rephrase that, the only spouse of a McGill principal to receive an honorary degree. And she played an important role in uh, Bob Bell's success as a principal. Uh, her, um, her gifts, uh, her, her ability to relate to people, her charm played an important role. I might add, uh, she was also a librarian and a graduate of the School of, um, of Information Studies at McGill. Um, this is, um, uh, um, this is, we're not, we're jumping ahead now to David Johnson. 
Uh, this is a picture with, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe somebody can correct me on this, but I think that might be Jean de Grandpre, the Chancellor. But I, but I, I might be, I may um, have a misidentification. But on the left, that is, uh, at least, yes, on the left, that is definitely David Johnson. Now, David Johnson looks very young, and there's a good reason why he did look young. Um, he was uh, the fifth youngest principal we ever had. He was 38 years old. Um, and, uh, but, and he is also uh, the fourth longest serving principal in the university's history, 15 years from 1979 to 1994. Uh, more than this, however, I think it's significant because he is the first of what I term the Ontario principals. He and his three successors um, have all come uh, to, to McGill via Ontario. And stop and think about the significance of this. Um, there would have been a time when it would have been laughable for a McGill principal to have come from an Ontario university. Uh, we know back in the old days, for instance, uh, that it was understood that you always went to Britain looking for a McGill principal. Uh, but no, we've had four in a row, beginning with David Johnson, who came from Ontario. What does that tell us? Obviously, there's something we can learn from Ontario. Um, now, um, D David's background was in law. He was a lawyer. He had been dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, David uh, put enormous emphasis into academic priorities. Uh, there was little or no new construction of the campus during his era. However, one of the things he's most noted for is the huge deficits which accumulated during his period. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later on. Um, the, uh, this next picture is interesting. This is uh, uh, David on the right. In the middle was the Chancellor, Conrad Harrington, and Bob Bell to the, to the left. Now this brings us to uh, Bernard Shapiro. Uh, Bernard Shapiro is very interesting because he's also a McGill graduate. Um, he was at that time the oldest principal that, uh, that McGill had ever had. Um, and uh, whereas um, uh, David Johnson uh, was principal during the uh, first referendum of 1980 in the Meech Lake referendum, um, Bernard Shapiro, he was principal during the second referendum of 1995. Um, um, Shapiro had a very difficult time of it financially. It was his uh, uh, years in office from 1994 to 2002. McGill um, um, went through probably the most difficult financial crisis in its history following after the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, this is a nice picture at the Roddy Gates of uh, Bernard Shapiro and uh, David Johnson together. Um, Bernard Shapiro with his wife Phyllis. Phyllis also had a, had a doctorate. And uh, Phyllis was probably, was considered to be um, Bernard Shapiro's closest confidant. And uh, a very nice lady very, with, a warm, with a very warm personality. Um, now this is a nice picture. This is convocation. Over at my extreme left there uh, was Dick Pound. Uh, who uh, ch chancellor and chairman of the Board of Governors. In the middle, Greta Chambers, um, 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 a chancellor. And then on the right, uh, you can see is, uh, is uh, Bernard Shapiro, um, to, to just, to, uh, to just to the right of, um, of uh, Greta Chambers. And in the extreme right-hand corner, this was the registrar at that time, uh, J.P. Uh, what was his name? J.P. Schuler, if I'm not mistaken. Many of you will remember him. Um, very, very nice. So the, now I went through these pictures and just gave you little capsules to give you, to remind everybody what it is that they, uh, uh, what happened during this uh, period, uh, 1970 to 2002, the context in terms of the times, the three principles. When, with the James McGill Society, I began my research actually by just looking at the three principles and I gave talks before the society on them. When I finished my third one on um, Bernard Shapiro, Stanley Frost approached me and said, Peter, Interesting talks. Yes, it's important to look at the principles, but remember, 
Remember, he cautioned, the history of McGill is about more than the principles. The principles are part of the story, an important part, but they're not the whole story. And that's what you have to get at. And this was advice which I took very, very seriously. Now, I should tell you that when you do research on any sort, particularly historical research, the way in which you uh, go about collecting your material and the way in which it will appear in the final form may not necessarily be the same. There can be significant differences in the approach. And I would have to be honest and tell you that what I ended up with isn't exactly what I started with, but it's a question of shaping your material in order to be able to, um, in, uh, to, 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 to show people something. So this is my table of contents. This is the general table of contents. And you can see uh, the first uh, three chapters, Bell, Johnson, and Shapiro, and McGill. And this is basically just to provide general context. Four, five, and six deal with the academic life, broken down by chapters each for, for the three principles. Seven, eight, and nine deal with finances. And 10, 11, and 12 deal with, com with McGill and community. And this is how I saw things. And it took me a while to reach this point. Um, when I was doing my initial research, I found it uh, that the, uh, con considering the uh, academic, the financial, and the community aspects of McGill so often were intertwined, but yet it didn't really lend itself to telling an effective story. And I found that the only way I could tell an effective story was by breaking them up. And I felt that it was also important to say specifically what happened under each principle dealing with academic, financial, and community because, frankly, this was the reality of uh, how things happened at McGill. I then looked at student life uh, and then the faculties. And, um, uh, but we'll get to that, that in all, all in good time. So let's begin, first of all, taking a look at uh, the principles and, and uh, McGill. And what I did, and this is a, a, a detailed breakdown of the chapters. For each chapter, I give it, indicate who they were. So this is Robert Bell, who he was, uh, what happened when he was principal, governance, vice principals, buildings, computers and computing, administrative structures, faculty and, and staff associations. The McGill Association of University Teachers is very important. The McGill University Non-Academic Association and unions. And um, it, I thought it was important, and then appendices, where I list office holders, who were the vice principals, uh, who uh, uh, were the presidents of these associations, um, who were the ministers of education at Quebec at that time, which political party, um, I just list these in appendices because I think it's important to provide context, but yet I wasn't sure I wanted to go into an awful lot of depth on them. One element about dealing with Robert Bell, which was unique, is you'll see that this item called collegiality. One of the major issues at McGill is collegiality. McGill claims to be a collegial university. What does that mean? What is the definition of collegiality? Are we still collegial? Um, were we ever collegial? These are the questions to be asked. And there was a very good book by a McGill professor on the fac School of Management by the name of Cynthia Hardy, who did a book on politics of collegiality, which she published in 1996, which although it focuses upon the Bell years, does um, deal with what collegiality meant generally at McGill, which he defined as, as, the, uh, as the finest example in Canada at that time of a collegial university. Mm -hmm. And by this, what she seems to mean is to what extent was there a bottom-up approach to decision-making as opposed to a, a, a downward approach to, to decision-making. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating study. And I felt that under Bell, this is where it, it really had, 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 had to fit in. 
I've been very in intrigued looking at computers and computing, how McGill um, um, uh, developed its, its computer system. Um, and with the vice principal, and then same with administrative structures. This raised one of the things which I became very aware of when I started looking closely at the vice principals was how unclear cut the roles of the vice principals were in the early years. Their portfolio seemed to combine strange mixtures of both academic and administrative activity. And one of the th things that's happened at McGill over the last 40 or 50 years is that these administrative and academic roles have become much more clear cut and much more segregated. In the 70s and 80s, they were, 60s, 70s and 80s, they were much less segregated and they were much more integrated. Depending upon your point of view, maybe that was a good thing, maybe it was a bad thing, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, there are many things of this sort which I'm looking at, but um, you might want to ask me questions afterwards which would look most, more closely at them. In terms of buildings and campus under Bob Bell, um, uh, construction, con uh, the, the, the building um, construction campaign begun under Rock Robertson continued. Uh, but by the end of the decade, it began, uh, it began diminishing. Um, so I th I'm, I'm sure there is more than one can say about this as well. Strikes, ah oh, yes, one should mention. Unions, there were strikes, short strikes, both in 1974 and 1980. And as far as the McGill Association of University Teachers is concerned, well, it did have a, a, um, a rival in the McGill Faculty Union, but otherwise the McGill faculty um, stayed away, has so far, has stayed away from unionization. Maybe wow. that will change sometime, but that is really um, um, the situation uh, at the moment. The administration of, administrative structure at McGill, well, I would say it was lean, efficient, flexible, humane, uh, but it provided um, limited infrastructure. And the ability of Bob Bell and the three principles I'm looking at to do some things I think was limited by the fact they didn't have uh, a large um, uh, bureaucratic structure. Now you may say that's a good thing. That's another issue. Um, looking again at governance, there was a major, uh, one major th thing you should be aware of, and this is in 1970. The position of chancellor of the university was divided up into chancellor and chairman of the board. Up until 1970, the chancellor and the chairman were one and the same thing. After 1970, they were separate positions. And the McGill administ uh, governance structure takes for granted that the principal, the chancellor, and the chairman of the board will always be singing from the same song sheet. And if they're not, then we know there will be, there, 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 there will be problems. Um, moving along. Let's take a look at what happened academically. Under Bell, you can see in this upper left-hand corner, um, I, I mentioned some of the things under him. Uh, Bob Bell um, um, f faced a Department of Education, which in the 1970s was very, very keen on centralization. And uh, so I talked about these orientations of higher education and the orientation report, which were all emanating from McGill's, from, pardon me, from Quebec's Department of Education. Um, McGill did not feel comfortable or happy about um, these attempts at centralization, but um, it did its best to go along without actually capitulating. McDonald College was the Department of Education's major attempt at centralizing at McGill. Uh, and it clearly had an agenda, first of all, to close the college, and secondly, to remove McDonald College from McGill. In the end, that didn't work, and one of the reasons it didn't work is that, uh, well, is that the Department of Agriculture favored McDonald College and its um, uh, faculty of agriculture. 
And also, the various Quebec farmers' unions, particularly those connected with the dairy industry, were also in support of Macdonald College. And in the end, what happened is, is that it um, joined forces with uh, John Abbott College, and the campus got split between the SAGEP and, uh, and McGill. The third factor, of course, that entered in was David Stewart, the heir and successor to Sir William MacDonald and the MacDonald fortune. And of course, it was Sir William MacDonald who founded MacDonald College. And David Stewart um, took very decisive legal and political action. And this also played a, a, a crucial role also. The Faculty of Arts and Administrative Law. One of the results of the Deutsch Weld and Asimakopoulos affair is, is that there was a realization that McGill needed administrative law for governing its internal activities, and the faculty handbook resulted. Uh, it's, a, it's not an entirely happy story, but it needed to be told. Now, David Johnson, when he came, he was faced with a report that was brought out calling planning for a smaller university because the assumption was that McGill would have to be smaller. It simply couldn't afford to be bigger. And David went along with it for about a year or two, and then he changed, um, he just changed direction and said, no, I'm not going aboard with this. McGill has to grow. And he saw it growing primarily uh, at the, uh, at the uh, graduate and the research level. And he brought in uh, cyclical reviews and annual reporting, a revised annual reporting system, and he began a faculty ranking um, uh, exercise. And David um, uh, developed a scenario in which he ranked the, univers the, the faculties of McGill in terms of which he thought were stronger or weaker, and uh, he just said that this is how they should be funded. And um, the result was, of course, that McGill did, uh, did grow, uh, and, uh, it, and, 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 and it was but primarily as a research-intensive graduate, uh, research graduate um, university. Under uh, Bernard Shapiro, of course, again, faced with uh, um, a financial situation, there were competing visions. And uh, one of them was is that McGill should even become a private university. I don't think myself that Bernard Shapiro favored doing this, but what he did was he got everybody talking about it and uh, think, re trying to rethink what uh, direction McGill should take academically. Financially, every principal of McGill has faced a financial crisis. Uh, Bob Bell had a big financial crisis, which was solved by the Summer Committee. Uh, Johnson, of course, big, big uh, financial crisis, and uh, he ended up with the largest um, um, uh, uh, collected um, uh, um, deficit, uh, accumulated deficit of any Canadian university, $79 million in 1991. Uh, Bernard Shapiro, the, the, the biggest financial crisis uh, since the Great Depression for McGill. What was the situation? I spent a lot of time on this, particularly looking at the operating funds and uh, trying to figure out what happened. I don't claim to have the final story, but as nearly as I can see, the story is this. The, um, in the early 70s, Quebec did a ranking system for all the universities, and they were put, they were put in ranked order. And right for the next 30 years, all the universities had to fit into that ranking. Your uh, grant might go up and down a bit depending upon enrollment or other things, but basically you were slotted at this level. And all of McGill's attempts during this period to say, this was the wrong slotting for us, we should be at least one slot higher, never uh, got, were able uh, to, uh, to get any traction. Um, community, well, what else? Oh, going back here, um, I should mention the other big thing are the capital campaigns. Uh, Bob Bell had won the Tay and Tomorrow campaign. 
fit David Johnson, the McGill Advancement Program, and the 21st Century Fund campaign, and they both made an enormous difference. Uh, Shapiro did not do a capital campaign. Uh, McGill and community, well, um, the Sesqu uh, Bell, the sesquicentennial, language legislation played a major role as McGill came uh, to grips with Bill 22, Bill 101. Um, McGill had begun doing so even earlier in the 1960s and early 70s, but uh, McGill found itself certainly uh, needing to come to accommodation. The last item, the Minister of Education, Jean-Jacques Yvonne Moran, they all had uh, these ministers of education, a number of them had important statements about education, which I've looked at very closely. Under David Johnson, both Dr. Camille Laurent and, and Claude Ryan had significant statements. Uh, but McGill's um, funding uh, issue still continued. And in 1989, David Johnson gave his famous Canadian Club speech in which he complained. Why was McGill underfunded? And he asked four questions. And he asked, was, uh, why, why we were underfunded? And uh, this created a sensation at the time. He, he asked, was it because three of the four underfunded universities were in Montreal, because three of the four were Anglophone? Was it because of a dislike of excellence? Or was it because McGill was the victim of its own success? You can well imagine, of course, that this created a sensation. And, um, and, and, and Le Devoir uh, published a, uh, an editorial at this time uh, with the phrase, un problème d'image. And it said that basically the problem for McGill was it had a problem of image. And this brings us to the Shapiro years and uh, our friend Jeanette Lamontagne and uh, the Government Relations Office. And uh, beginning under Johnson, but becoming particularly active under Shapiro, the Government Relations Office played a major role in um, getting uh, McGill involved with government. And then Francois Legault became uh, Minister of Education. And he issued several very important uh, policy statements on, um, on, uh, on education, uh, higher education. And he promised to fix McGill's funding problem. He admitted McGill was underfunded. Its slotting in the historical pattern was wrong. And he said that it was $16 million, that McGill was underpaid by $16 million. Now, where that came from is uncertain. And he promised that it would be made up a $1 million a year over 16 years. Well, all right. Uh, um, I, McGill's attitude was it's better than nothing, but I would say that's about as far as it went. Um, Student life at McGill. Um, I won't spend very much time on this. This was based entirely from the McGill Daily. And, we, and I were, had research assistants help me on this. I must confess, I did little of the legwork on this. But they looked at student politics, attitudes towards administration, tuition. And then, of course, you can appreciate sexual politics, AIDS, same sex, women, racial politics, blacks, African-Canadians, African-Americans, First Nations, other race-related issues, all the sorts of things the McGill Daily would be involved with. Um, this brings us to looking at the faculties, where I spent a lot of time. And this is, uh, from a budgetary point of view, what happened at McGill uh, between uh, over a 20-year uh, span. If you uh, look at the, uh, at, at the three uh, columns, the three left-hand columns, they're all for the year 76, 77. The three on the right are 1997-98. And you can see what happened over a 20-year period from the late 70s to late 90s. Science, which in the 70, at the end of the 70s was the best funded faculty at 20%, by the late 90s, falls to second place in 17%. Medicine rose from 19.9, almost 20%, to 28.8%, almost a 50% increase. And other faculties, some went up, some went down. Um, arts and science went down. Uh, education and uh, dentistry 
and religious studies all went down. But uh, some faculties, um, it's, um, such as uh, management, music, law, they went up. And um, so therefore the question arises, why did some faculties go up and why did some faculties go down? And basically I would say it's a combination of enrollment, but it also reflects the fact that they fitted better into the university's new paradigm, emphasizing research and uh, graduate studies. So some people have asked me why I spent so much time looking at each faculty. And uh, they're not full-scale histories. What I look at is who were the deans, what was the housing, undergraduate and graduate programs, and research, and anything special that happened. But so much hap did happen. Uh, remember, in in the, my period, 1970, opens with the Faculty of Arts and Science. But in 1971, it ceased existence. And we had separate faculties of arts and science developed. Why did arts and science cease to exist? Why did it split in two? Um, of the arts faculty, of the humanities and social science faculties, uh, arts had the biggest problem with financing, and I might add, complained bitterly about it. Education, of course, its funding fell. Well, this was a combination of falling birth rate in Bill 101. Management, music, and law all went up. Why did they go up? Well, again, enrollment and their research profile. Religious studies is an interesting case in point. It, uh, uh, it had certainly the academic profile in terms of research and graduate studies, uh, but it did have, some, it did have problems with, with enrollment. Um, med, uh, the, the medical, scientific, and engineering faculties. Well, medicine was identified by by uh, J David Johnson immediately and thereafter uh, by principals and vice principals as McGill's um, leading faculty, the one that deserved to be uh, most highly funded. But it's also a question of personality. Um, David Johnson and, uh, and uh, Richard Cruz, the dean of medicine, formed a very close personal friendship they were living room friends. Um, you, uh, and then, of course, the vice principal academic uh, through the 1980s uh, under David Johnson was Sam Friedman, a former dean of medicine. And these three men, Johnson, Cruz, and Shapiro, uh, they may remade McGill to a considerable extent, insisting that all McGill faculties and schools and departments needed to be research intensive, and all faculty needed to be research intensive. Um, engineering's support remained more or less constant. Agriculture, more or less constant. Uh, science went down. Dentistry went down. It came very close to being closed. It had major problems. Uh, and, uh, but of course, part of the problem was is that it was the last faculty at the university to develop a research graduate faculty um, uh, profile. The cross-disciplinaries, graduate studies and research, well, this is fascinating because uh, in 2002, it ceases to be a faculty and it becomes the, uh, the Office of Graduate and Postgraduate Studies. Um, uh, this and the reasons why this happened are quite intriguing. Continuing education is meant, of course, to be a milch call. Its job is to make money for the university and McGill has had a highly ambivalent, ambiguous attitude towards continuing education. Does it believe in it? Does it think it's important? Um, it's uh, continuing education's relationship with the faculty of management is a very intriguing and complex one. And uh, I can't discuss it tonight, but I tr tried looking into it uh, uh, in my volume. The libraries and student services. Libraries. Um, uh, um, during, the, uh, um, during the Johnson years, uh, embark upon a massive, a massive 
um, digitization, uh, computerization project. Extremely expensive, and the fact that McGill was able to find the money for it was very important. However, there was a problem with the collections, and there's a continuing concern all through the period of this volume. Are the libraries being sufficiently funded in terms of developing their collections? Student services I finish with. Um, it has a dean, and uh, it, along with the, my, uh, my chapter dealing with the McGill Daily, are my two attempts to really deal with student life at McGill, because there is obviously an issue with any university history, to what extent do we deal with students, but I feel between this chapter and my chapter on the, uh, uh, on the McGill Daily, that I'm able to give reasonably good attention to it. Uh, it's uh, what, what can one say about student services except that um, it's uh, m mostly a self-funded activity. It gets a certain amount of money from McGill, but most, from, from, pardon me, from, it gets a certain amount of money from Quebec City, um, and, uh, but it also receives student fees. And uh, its role at McGill is very important. And I'm intrigued with it because up until the mid-1960s, McGill basically did nothing in the way of student services. And the way in which, since 1965, McGill has moved forward to provide um, its, its current level of student services is an intriguing story, which I thought was well worth, was well worth covering. Well, as you can see, I've done quite a bit of talking. Um, and uh, you've been very good, you've been very, very patient, and uh, as with all good talks, and even not so good talks, uh, there should be a conclusion. And I would like to say, just to go back again to Dr. Frost. Uh, Dr. Frost and I, to some extent, have been involved in the business of creating um, a chronologically arranged encyclopedia. Uh, we haven't maybe covered every aspect of what's happened at McGill, but we're trying to cover enough of them to give some encyclopedic sense. What is the big difference? Well, Dr. Frost emphasized individuals. I tend to emphasize trends and issues. It's not that I dislike people. Please take it for granted. I like you all. I think you're all wonderful. But uh, I, I tend to be an issues, trends sort of guy. Neither Dr. Frost nor I have pretended to write the final word on McGill's history. But this is not for all Dr. Volumes, two volumes, and how much I put in this volume. It's not the final word. What it is, is the first word. We have done the first world's words, provided the sign posts in the sea for future researchers and readers. I should also say that Dr. Frost and I share an intellectual and ethical ethical commitment to the importance of history. Uh, speaking for myself, I do not repudiate history. Most certainly, I do not repudiate the history of McGill University. The history of McGill, like the history of anything, is essential. To, first of all, to have a uh, correct historical memory, to avoid the past being clouded by un unknown, by institutional an amnesia, or collective Alzheimer's, deliberately or accidentally. Misusing history through distortion or invention is a constant threat, uh, another major reason why you need history. When this volume appears, relatively soon, I hope, I will look forward to the public response. In the meantime, I would like to thank the James McGill Society for your ongoing support and interest, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, everyone. Good evening. Please uh, approach the mic if you have any questions or comments. Give me one second. Well, thank you very much, sir. Peter, is this on? Yes. Um, I've, you've covered a lot of ground. I mean, there's just too much there to really come across in one hour, so I appreciate your tremendous effort. I came to McGill in 1986. It was a mid-career move, as you know, from Vancouver, UBC to here. People said, why in the world are you moving to McGill? Well, there was a certain charm, I must say, when I came here. And two things stood out in my mind was, uh, first of all, very strong leadership 
at above my departmental level. The dean of science at the time was um, Bill Leggett, just yes. came in. And uh, Friedman, Sam Friedman was there. But also there was another person in the wings who I think I highly uh, respected and was quite visionary. That was, uh, I guess he was a VP of uh, research, or uh, he was uh, Mick McLaughlin. That's Gordon right. McLaughlin. He was Gordon Dean McLaughlin. of Graduate Studies of, and Vice right. Principal Research and Dean of Graduate right. Studies. And he was very much uh, supporting you know, cross uh, disciplinary research, uh, visionary people bringing together different ideas. And I don't know whether you've covered that at all in your volume or will, but. That to me was a very exciting part of McGill in those times. Yes, I knew um, I, I knew Gordon McLaughlin quite well. Um, my school, the School of Information Studies, uh, was for uh, 30 years from the mid 60s to the mid 90s under the jurisdiction of the Faculty of Graduate Studies, and uh, I knew Gordon very well. He was a very good uh, dean of graduate studies, and as you say, um, uh, he had the additional advantage, of course, uh, in the 1980s of in increased funding for research. And I deal with this in my uh, chapter on graduate studies. A problem in the 1970s was that funding for graduate studies was very low anywhere and for research. And uh, this was a real problem for the faculty of science. And then in the 1980s, both Ottawa and Quebec City began uh, a competition to see who could give more money. And, uh, and McGill did very well with both of them. And Gordon, he he, 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 did a, he, he was on top of this very much. But uh, uh, when uh, Dr. Shapiro became principal, he seemed to, to be concerned that the graduate studies uh, was attempting to do too much. And he cut it back dramatically. And one of the concerns was is that it did have a number of units uh, uh, that reported under it, under its jurisdiction. So by taking away its faculty status, that meant that it could no longer have academic units under it. Um, so the person who writes the next volume will have to deal with this and how effective or ineffective that has been. But I stopped in 2000. I should add, I was the speaker of the Graduate Faculty Council uh, uh, during this period. And uh, so I, I chaired the last meeting of the Graduate Faculty Council before it left. That's probably a, a longer answer than you really needed. Uh, are there any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, has anybody online? Are there any online questions? I've. Uh, I, I hope I haven't created amnesia for everybody by uh, <laughs> by talking too too much. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Lord. Um, I. I I really appreciate your talk and, and your insights, and, and I completely, um, it's beautiful, your outline and the way you're going to present trends and conflicts and everything. So all I can add is just two little stories. They're purely my personal um, meetings with two of those uh, principals. One is Shapiro. So I was called to his office uh, in 1995, it was summertime, and I didn't know why, and he, you know, when I asked how should I prepare, there was no, um, nothing <laughs> from, the, from his secretary. So I arrived and I sat opposite him. He was in that big desk, and I think it's still there. I think Madame Fortier still uses that desk. And that's what he, very quietly, he stayed seated, and um, he said, <laughs> you see this desk? And I said, yes, I do. He said, well, it, it is Principal Dawson's desk. And, and Principal Dawson founded the Red Path Museum where you work. And I said, yes, I do. And he said, I, I just don't, it's not, it's not really being kept in good shape. And I, I, I had no idea what he meant. And he started to point out on the leather surface various dents and cracks and dried, you know, the leather had become a little bit degraded. And he wanted my advice as a museum uh, conservator, curator, on how he should treat Principal Dawson's desk. So I, <laughs> after a lot of sort of awkward, <laughs> you know, fumbles, I said, just go get some Neats food oil. He said, where can I get that? And I said, Hogs Hardware. 
and uh, as far as I know, I think he did give it a. Tr I offered to come around and help him out with <laughs> some rags, but um, that was that was the first time I'd ever really seen a human caring <laughs> principle take time and effort to look after some artifacts that he needed to work with, and he cared enough about them. Well, that's them. very nice. So there's a little story there. Thank you. I mentored with T.H. Uh, Clark, Thomas Henry Clark, for the first uh, 10 years at, at the Red Path Museum. T.H. Clark arrived in 1924. He was the director of the Red Path. Uh, he always said he did his best work after um, his retirement. He ended up dying at the age of 103, I was able to write his, type up his handwritten resignation letter, which he wrote on the eve of his 99th birthday, where he basically had to let the principal know he really did have to stop working <laughs> right now. Um, he once said to me, uh, so as, as I mentored with him, we had, we, we talk a little bit, not much. He was very very purposeful in his work. He worked on the fossils and the rocks and mm -hmm. the geological samples he'd collected from the St. Lawrence Lowlands and had published the geological reports for the, um, for the Quebec Ministry of Natural Resources at the time. But at one, one time he said to me, oh, Cyril James wasn't a wet eye at his funeral. Oh. And you responded by... I did say, oh, why was that? And he sort of, he looked down, he was kind of, he didn't really want to elaborate, but he said, well, no one really liked him. I said, why? And he said, do you know he wanted to cement the entire place, the entire place, from the front field, right from Sherbrooke Street, back to James so that he'd never have to walk on any dirt or any, you know, green on his way to his office. And that was it. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that didn't happen. Uh, we are. That's what I said. So thank you. Thank, thank you for your reminiscence. Are there any other questions, any other comments for us? Well, th thank you then very much, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No idea. <clears throat> I would have... You would have liked to make a comment. Raise your hand for a place to take. Peter, um, many years ago I used to uh, go out for a walk at lunchtime or have to scurry from one building to the other in the back alley here. And I'd see you. And uh, never knew who you were. Um, we did say hello on occasion, uh, rather uncomfortably on, on both sides, I guess. Uh, you know, because I had tripped over something or, you know, we were getting wet in the rain. I, I, I really don't have too much of a memory for that. But the point is, uh, when I saw you, I, I thought, you know, th this guy must be important because he, he's, he's a fixture in the restaurant in the Leacock building. He's at a table. You know, it's not this table or that table Monday or Tuesday. It's the table. And the other thing was, um, if he wasn't there, he was at a table in Thompson House with graduate students who were all laughing. And it was obvious to me that, you know, he was important. I, you know, he wasn't the president of the Royal Bank of Canada or the Canadians, but he was important. And the affection that your students have shown you through the years and the affection your colleagues have shown you and the respect they have for you in talking to you about their recollections of meeting principals and having conversations about finance or administration at McGill is borne out in what you told us tonight. And if you hadn't listened as attentively to them, if you hadn't brought some of that into your notes, if you hadn't brought that into your research and into the delivery of what you gave us today, we would all be poorer. And I look forward to putting volume three on my shelf between two of my favorite books, Golfing for Cats and Nothing Ever Happens in Point Claire. 
Thank you, Peter. It was absolutely wonderful. And, and when you talked about collegiality, I think you hit on one of the secrets of a great university, and that's the existence of collegiality. And we see it in this room, we see it everywhere on campus. And there's even a plaque in the lobby of this building that hints about that, that, that drives your, your, your attention to it. And that collegiality, that ability of people in different walks of life, in, in different trades, in different professions, to be able to talk together, to be able to achieve something, is the secret of greatness. And that has propelled this university through the ages and will continue to do so. And I look forward on a very personal level to, to reading volume three, and I'm sure everybody else here does. Thank you once again. The next meeting of the James McGill Society will take place sometime in the new year, a date to be determined, and we'll let you know when. The topic, the presentation topic, will be Unsung Heroes of McGill, and it will be presented by an old friend of ours, Gordy Burr. We'd like your comments on the delivery of um, these meetings, uh, whether you're happy with the hybrid format, whether you prefer the personal live format or whether Zoom is good for you. Please let us know if you have complaints, if you have suggestions, please let us know. Thank you for your continuing uh, support. Again, I, I heard this evening that the bicentennial of the university is going into uh, 2021. So happy birthday, McGill, again. And we'll, we'll say that again next year. Uh, and now uh, I think we, we must adjourn. And I want to wish all of you the happiest of holidays. And, uh, um, you know, think about it, the, this really lousy year that has taken place, 2021, and let's hope that 2022 offers us something much, much nicer. Thank you, and good night.